Hey, welcome to the Carnegie Center for Art and History, right here in downtown New Albany. You heard that right, we are a museum of both art and history. Did you know that art and history overlap all the time? Can you think of any examples? I'll give you a clue. The first example is under my feet and over my head. It's architecture. Architecture refers to the art and science of a building design, and if it's very old, it can be historic. This building was built in 1904 and was the very first public library in New Albany. It was paid for in part by Andrew Carnegie, who was a philanthropist. That meant that he gave away a lot of his own wealth for good causes. In his lifetime, he funded thousands of libraries around the world, donating the modern equivalent of more than $76 billion of his fortune. By creating public libraries, that meant that more people had free access to books regardless of how much money they personally had, and that meant free access to knowledge, which opens up all sorts of doors for people. The Carnegie Center was New Albany's library for 65 years, and actually, it still is a branch of the Floyd County Library. But instead of checking out books, you can come see exhibitions about local history and art by artists who lived a long time ago, as well as contemporary artists who are still making art today. Their work reflects the feelings, thoughts, and ideas about our world. Right over here is another example of how art and history can overlap. It's a landscape painting of New Albany by an artist named George Morrison, and it was painted in 1851. Art like this can teach us about history by showing us what our surroundings look like way before our great, great, great grandparents were born. Let's take a closer look. We see the mighty Ohio River with Kentucky on that side and Indiana over here. Notice that there aren't any bridges yet, just steamboats to bring people back and forth. The Carnegie Building wasn't built yet when this painting was made. The Culberson Mansion wasn't either. It would be built about 20 years later after this painting was made. And Division Street School would be built about 15 years later. But do you see any buildings that you do recognize? This building here is a Scribner House, the oldest home still standing in New Albany. When this painting was made, it was already 37 years old. It's surrounded by trees in this painting instead of parking lots, the YMCA, and other downtown buildings that surround it today. And over here, you see that steeple? That's Second Baptist Church, also known as Town Clock Church, which still stands today. The history of some of these places are filled with amazing stories of people who were just like you and me, except that they lived 150 years ago. Some of their stories have been lost to time, and some are remembered as extraordinary people. Let's see if we can get a closer look and learn about this one. I want to tell you a story about Jacob. I want you to use your imagination. Jacob is 13 years old and wants to escape from being a slave. Being a slave meant he was someone's property, the same as a piece of furniture. He could be bought and he could be sold and treated cruelly. It is dark and Jacob sleeps in a hut with the other slaves on the edge of a forest. After the lights have gone out in the big house where his master lived, he slips out of bed pretending to use the necessary room, the bathroom. An old friend had told him about a place called Canada, where Negro men can live free. All he knew for sure about Canada is that it's north, so he looks for the North Star. The North Star would be the only map Jacob had to help him get to freedom. The old man told him there are folks above the Ohio River in New Albany who can help him if he can just make it out of Kentucky. The Ohio River separated Floyd County, Indiana, a northern free state, from Louisville, Kentucky, a southern slave state. And for slaves who managed to catch a ride across that river and get close to New Albany, they could look up at a church on its shore and see its steeple, 150 feet high in the sky. It was a beacon of hope that could be seen for miles. 
Jacob knows his chances are slim. Anybody who spots a black man on his own will know he is a runaway. Jacob has seen captured slaves put over the barrel and beat till the blood runs down. But so what? He has already got the scars on his back to prove you don't have to try escaping in order to get beaten bloody. As day breaks, he can see the birds flying north after the winter. They will show him the way. But in the distance, he hears dogs barking. Can they have discovered that he is missing already? Or is it just a hunter? He has no idea how far he has come during the night, but he cannot take the chance. He runs through a stream to cover his scent and hopes it will throw the dogs off his trail. He hides until he feels safe. This is how he lives for a long time, running at night, hiding during the day, taking food where he can find it, fearing the sound of every dog, every voice. He has been tired and hungry for so many days that he has lost count. Finally, a great river lies before him. Is this the Ohio River his friend told him about? He sees a church steeple across the river. It must be the Ohio, the border between North and South, slave states and free states. He has heard stories that in that church are good people that will help runaway slaves escape to the North. The river is too big to swim, and he is too tired to keep going now. So he hides himself in the leaves and goes to sleep until morning comes. When he crawls out, his breath catches in his throat. A black man is standing 20 paces in front of him, staring at him. Come with me, he says. He has a skiff, a boat that takes Jacob across the river. Jacob cannot believe he is really on his way to freedom. Now, I was only 13 years old when I made that journey. I've been living in the North ever since, but I still need to be careful because even though I'm free, if my former slave master found me, he could take me back and then I'd be a slave again. But my escape journey was worth risking my life all over again. I didn't have a map. There were no books on how and where to escape to. No one was writing down the directions about how to steal away up North because it had to be a secret. So I'm telling you this now so you'll remember my story. Jacob's story is just one of many thousands of people like him who traveled on the Underground Railroad to escape slavery before the Civil War. Most things we know about the Underground Railroad are actually from oral history, which means that we learned about them through the stories and memories of people who lived through them. After all, Enslaved folks like Jacob weren't allowed to learn how to read or write, so they could only tell their tales with their words. I'm Reverend Marshall of the Second Baptist Church, also known as the Town Clock Church here in New Albany. There are still many mysteries about the history of the Underground Railroad in our country, but through diligent research, we have a pretty good understanding of it. For one thing, we know that the Underground Railroad wasn't really a railroad with trains or even a tunnel underground. We know it was a secret system of people working together to help others find freedom. And we know that many of these helpers were members of the free African-American community. Our own church here was once believed to be involved in the Underground Railroad. Behind this door is the undercroft of our church with a dirt floor and a dark brick room. Our history tells us that this undercroft acted as additional space to conceal freedom seekers when they stopped in New Albany and needed a place to stay hidden. I'll take you in there and tell you more about the mysteries of this undercroft next time. But for now, let's go into the sanctuary. Look around. I'm standing in the main sanctuary of the church. See the stained glass windows, the intricate woodwork of the church pews and altar, the chandeliers above us. When this church was built around 1850, New Albany was the largest city in the state of Indiana. So the builders of the church spared no expense in decorating it. 
This sanctuary wasn't only a beautiful place for its members to worship God. This church was also a metaphorical sanctuary, a safe place for people desperately seeking freedom. The leaders of this church during that period in New Albany were powerful people. Many of those people chose to use their power and influence to help the poor and needy in our city. Church member Lucy Bishop, the wife of second pastor John Bishop, is thought to have worked together with other women to collect food, clothing, and medical supplies to freedom seekers like Jacob as they were passing through the city. Member James Haynes, who was the conductor of the New Albany Salem Railroad, refused to allow police on board to capture escaped slaves. There are even rumors that church leader James Brooks, who was the first president of the New Albany Salem Railroad, would give free tickets to freedom seekers so that they could have a safe passage north. Unusual as it was at that time for churches to be integrated with whites and blacks, there are records showing pastors of this church performing marriages, baptisms, and funerals for members of the free African American community in New Albany. This church has served many people with many different needs over the course of its 150 plus years. But it, and the many people associated with it, have always been willing to take great risks to help people who need it the most. And we hope you feel the same. My daughter Blanche always loves to decorate for Christmas. We have this grand house and my husband William and I take tradition very seriously. Pardon my manners, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Cornelia Culbertson and my husband is William Culbertson. You may have heard of him, after all, he is one of the wealthiest men in the state of Indiana right now. I'm not telling you this to brag about our wealth, but we want outsiders to this town to respect New Albany and think of it as a prosperous city. Our home was built in 1869 and is an excellent example of French Second Empire style architecture. The house is three stories, more than 20,000 square feet, and has 25 rooms. Mr. Culbertson and I love and appreciate art and have commissioned or hired artists to paint the designs on the walls, ceilings, and cornices of the first and second floors. Artists use the technique of trump low in several rooms to mimic paneling, molding, or other textured surfaces. Special tools were used to create the look of wood graining. We also commissioned Mr. George Morrison, a fellow New Albanian, to paint several portraits of ourselves and family, and you can see those throughout the house. Our lifestyle may look grand and easy, but we've had hardships just like everyone else. See, I'm William's second wife. His first wife, Eliza Vance, died of pneumonia. She and William had eight children, and when she passed, Five of their children were between the ages of six months to 18 years. They were now motherless. Two years later, William's oldest daughter, Julia, died at just 21 years old. William was actually my second husband. My first husband died, making me a widow. William's father also died when William was only 10 years old, making his mother a widow also. A widow is a person whose husband has died. In the 1800s, women were not allowed to support themselves without a husband, father, or son to care for them. If they didn't have a close male relative to support them, life could be extremely hard for widowed women. William saw their struggles, and so he created a home for the widows of New Albany. The home was a place where women could feel safe and supported. 
Mr. Culbertson was involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the home and wanted to make sure that the residents had everything they needed. He was well known for doing all of the grocery shopping for the ladies, purchasing furniture for the house, and making sure they were comfortable. The widow's home was around for almost 100 years. After William's father passed, William's mother had a difficult time supporting the family. So at age 15, William left his family to take a job in a dry goods store. While he worked there, he gained a good reputation as a smart young man and a diligent worker. In 1835, William left his job in Pennsylvania to head west to the city of New Albany, Indiana. He had with him a very good recommendation from his employer that read, in part, his general character is good, his disposition cheerful and engaging. This helped him eventually get a job at the dry goods store in New Albany. He would go on to start his own business, which he spent 10 years building into a success. Over the years, he made many investments in things like real estate, railroads like the K&I Bridge, just a few blocks from here, and much more. Oh, good work, Blanche. Children have always had a special place in my heart, especially orphans. An orphan is a child whose parents have died and do not have close relatives to care for them. I've worked tirelessly to provide care to our city's orphans because they are dependent on the kindness of strangers. Cornelia sadly died in 1880. Shortly following her death, William founded the Cornelia Memorial Orphans Home on Eakin Avenue here in New Albany. He bought the land, paid for the construction, and then turned the institution over to trustees for management. While Cornelia and Blanche enjoyed a comfortable life, they did not have their own independence. Blanche was strong-willed and would go on to join the women's suffrage movement, fighting the decades-long fight to win the right to vote for women in the United States. The Culbertsons were known for supporting local businesses and charities of all kinds. They loved their community and wanted to support them through donating money to charity. Today we call this philanthropy, but in the 1870s they used a different word. They said benevolence. That is a big word that basically means kindness. Giving to help others in need is a form of kindness, and the Culbertson family gave a lot to others. One newspaper article talked of a children's charity, the Busy Bees, who he helped raise money to build a children's hospital. He gave to his church, and he gave bread tickets to the poor. These were little slips of paper that people could exchange for loaves of bread at the bakery. The Culbertsons were well known for their charity. Mr. Culbertson was very smart, and he thought of the well-being of the future residents of New Albany. He was always looking to the future. He wanted the people of the city to have access to electricity and clean water, as well as fire hydrants in case of fire. He formed a group to bring water services to the city and was successful in doing so. Having clean water helped keep people healthy, access to heat kept them warm in the winter, and electricity provided things like street lamps that made the city safer. We can learn a lot from the Culbertson family about caring for our community and each other. And now we have a new vocabulary word, benevolence, which means kindness in action. What kind of actions can you take in your own life to support your community? It doesn't have to be as grand as building the town waterworks. Maybe you bring groceries to a neighbor or show a friend you care when they are going through a hard time. We can all be benevolent and carry on the legacy of the Culbertson family. Welcome to Scribner House. Welcome to New Albany, and welcome to Floyd County. They all started with my grandfather, Joel Scribner, and two of his brothers, Abner and Nathaniel. This is our back parlor where we gather as a family. Just two months after landing their boat on the 2nd of March in 1813, the Scribner brothers felled the first tree to build their own log home. It started to rise on the 2nd of May, 1813. And on the 2nd of November of that same year, 1813, the first lots were sold in the new town of New Albany in Indiana Territory. I reckon they were true pioneers, the first white people to explore and settle this area. Then, without hardly taking a breath, in 1814, Grandfather Joel began building this house. It's been home to Grandfather Joel and Grandmother Mary, 
It was home to my father, William Augustus Scribner, and my mother, Caroline, and my stepmother, Harriet Partridge Hale. It's home to me, Hattie Scribner. I was born in this house. We Scribners owned Scribner House for three generations and 103 years. We founded the New Albany school system, holding the first classes here. We never had any excuse for missing school. And we established the first Presbyterian church, having services here until the town clock church could be built. We never had any excuse for missing church either. <laughs> the second floor has two bedrooms. We were all in here together, sharing stories, secrets, and love. My father was a medical doctor. He would take his medical equipment and supplies in these saddlebags. He might be gone for a few hours or a day or more. He was always ready to go help. We had many wonderful tea parties in this cozy alcove between the two flues. It was always warm and always sunny, or so it seemed. We always had cookies and biscuits to share. We like to spend summer evenings out here on the back porch. The breeze off the river is always cool, and we watch the river boats make their last few miles of daylight travel. Often the captains salute each other with blasts from their steam whistles. And on very special nights, when the night blooming Sirius sends its perfume out to the entire neighborhood, our friends come to sit up on the porch and enjoy the cool, sweet-smelling darkness and peace. In the waning years of Hattie Scribner's life, there were hard financial times as she struggled to support herself and properly maintain her home. Fine tables were found on the woodpile out back, possible evidence that she had been burning furniture to heat her home. She had been approached by local businessmen to sell, knowing that the home would likely be torn down. So many people did not fully appreciate the importance of saving it, so future generations would know the stories of the town's early history. In the spring of 1917, Miss Hattie sold Scribner House to her fellow sisters in the local chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution, with the stipulation that she would remain in her home till the end of her days. She died just a few months later in September of 1917, securing the knowledge that the chapter would care for her family home and preserve its unique history. So, a full three generations of this family resided here for 103 years from 1814 in the early days of this nation when our fourth president, James Madison, resided in the White House, through the Civil War and our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, till 1917, in the midst of World War I and the Spanish influenza pandemic, during the administration of our 28th president, Woodrow Wilson. In 2020, 103 more years have transpired since the Piankashaw chapter acquired this Indiana home, which brings us to contemporary times and what we hope to be the beginning of the waning days of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Piankashaw chapter, Daughters of the American Revolution, proudly carry on as historians and caretakers for Scribner House so that you too may walk its halls and hear its stories. My name is Vic McGinnity. I'm a retired teacher from Scribner Middle School. One of my really good friends at Scribner was Katherine Hickerson. She was the school secretary. We usually had lunch together, and one day in 1995, we were having lunch and I noticed she was very sad, very upset, and I asked her what the problem was, and she said, they're getting ready to tear down my little elementary school where I went to grades one through six. I said, where is that school? What's its name? Division Street School, she said. I said, oh, that's the school's maintenance shop, isn't it? She said, yes, but when I was a little girl, it was grades one through six, and that's where I spent my years of early schooling from the late 1930s to the early 1940s. 
And in those days, schools were segregated. Black kids had to go to secondary schools that were not nearly as well made or well equipped as the white kids. And that was common across the United States until the 1950s when segregation ended. That day, I went to the school for the first time ever, walked into the building, and sure enough, there were maintenance workers. I talked to them, and they all agreed, yes, it's going to be torn down. A new building is going to be built out on Grantline Road. I looked around, cardboard had replaced some of the broken windows, holes were in the wall, water was standing in the basement. It really was in bad shape. So I went back the next day and talked to Catherine. I gave her the bad news that it really was going to be torn down. And she looked at me with a tear in her eye. I'll never forget that. And she said, Vic, would you help me save that little building? Well, as a history teacher and someone that loved history, I said, well, yes, I'll help you any way I can. We formed a group called Friends of Division Street School. The first thing we did, we met with the superintendent of schools. He asked us some pointed questions. He said, how old is that building? Well, we hadn't done our research. We weren't sure. How is that building so significant it needs to be saved? We had to do research. So after two to three weeks, we had the research we needed. We had a second meeting with the superintendent. We gave him the really good news from our part. The building was built in 1884, making it the oldest segregated school still remaining in the state of Indiana, still owned by the school corporation that had it built. So he was very, very interested and realized it would not be good for the community to tear this building down. So he rented the building to us for $1 a year, very good rent, but he said, now listen, You've got to raise all the money it takes to restore that building. There's nothing in our budget to do that. We thought, oh, well, we can do that in a short period of time. Well, it took 10 years. 10 years later, we raised $400,000, and we had the school ready to go. Meanwhile, Catherine had expressed a three-part dream to me. Number one, save the building. Number two, restore the building. And number three, make it a school again. We worked with the school corporation and developed a curriculum much like that used a hundred and more years ago, focusing on fourth grade students. We envisioned all fourth grade classes coming here from Floyd County, New Albany, Floyd County, for a full day of instruction. And our first class was in 2005. Catherine came to that first class she was very ill at the time, but she didn't want to miss it. It was very important to her. She was pulling an oxygen tank and breathing through tubes in her nose. But when she was introduced by the teacher, she stood up and gave this wonderful, impassioned speech on what it meant to her to see students in that building learning again, just like when she was a little girl. Two weeks later, Catherine passed away. But you know, she lived long enough to fulfill her three-part dream. The building was saved, restored, and it was turned into school again. And this little building, to me, envisions her spirit and her legacy. Even though it was important for Catherine, it's so important for the community and this whole area because it represents one of the more important historical facets of this entire area. Because the children that went to this little school did not get equal treatment. The white schools were made out of bricks and mortar. This little building was made out of wood and frame. And the children that went to this school, many of them became very successful, but some were deprived of getting the full education that they should have gotten. So this building, thanks to Katherine Hickerson and her spirit, has been saved for future generations. And a hundred years from now, we hope, children can come into this building and realize 
how important it is to the community then as well as now. All right, good morning. Boys and girls, we're gonna start out this morning like we do every morning. Let's have our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Very good. You may now take your seats, open your packet, your learning packet to the page where we have the state of Indiana. And the main thing we're going to talk about today is where and when our different capitals were established in Indiana. All right, where is our capital today in Indiana? Indianapolis, that's correct, Indianapolis. Please write, put your star there and write Indianapolis. Before Indianapolis, where was our capital? Who can tell me, it starts with a C. Corridon is correct. Corridon was where it was, the capital. And you will mark that there where you see a little dot that I have there for a Corridon. And as you know, the Scribner brothers had established New Albany in 1813. And they had connections, of course, with where they came from, the state of New York, and they had connections with uh, Illinois and others. But they had established and had friends that wanted to uh, put in the railroad. Now, can you tell me the K and I Railroad? What did that stand for? Kentucky and Indiana Railroad. Right here along where Indiana is separated from Kentucky. Something else that had an important part of our state and of New Albany and how New Albany grew so well was the river. The river is, what, what river is that? The Ohio River. You will make that, you will draw that in so that you know where it is as far as close to, in, uh, close to New Albany. All right, boys and girls, you'll do your geography and your packet. And while you're doing that, we're going to go into our spelling, which is emphasis on our syllables. Hi, welcome back. Now that we've taken a closer look at a few historic sites, I want to ask you a question. Why do you think it's important to learn about history? Here at the Carnegie, we think it's because when we understand what happened in the past, it helps us to understand our world today. If we look and listen closely to those stories, we can see examples of ways that we can help make this world a better place now. History is not always made by epic things that happen in world-famous places to famous people. It can also be made by everyday people in small but meaningful ways. People like brave young Jacob, who risked his life for freedom from slavery, and the members of Town Clock Church, who took a chance and gave him and others shelter because they knew it was the right thing to do. Families like the Culbersons and the Scribners, who often use their positions to improve the city as a whole, rather than just to improve their own fortunes and the people who found it, attended, and then revived Division Street School, proving that powerful things can happen when people put aside their differences and work together for a common good. At the Carnegie, we honor the extraordinary courage of ordinary people in our history exhibition about the Underground Railroad and local woman, Lucy Higgs Nichols, who has an amazing story about escaping from slavery and becoming a Civil War nurse. Each of the places you've seen today is determined to preserve this rich history for future generations like you. 
We hope you appreciate history and art as much as we do, and we hope that one day you'll even make some history of your own. You have the power to become extraordinary too, in your own unique way. Thanks for spending time with us. Take care, and we hope to see you at one of these historic sites real soon.